Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming out to, uh, to hear this talk. Uh, my name is Todd Deary. Um, my talk today is called Scrum Hero, uh, Gamifying Game Development. Um, Scrum Hero is, well, it's an idea. It's a game of sorts. Um, and it was an experiment. And like all experiments or ideas, it started really with um, a, a big question. And that question was, what would happen if you tried to gamify the game development experience? Would your game development team become more productive? Would your game that you're developing or app that you're developing improve? Um, would your game developers be happier? Would they be more motivated? Would they want to come to work every day? Would their morale increase? These are the things that Scrum Hero uh, is trying to address and we tried to address when we ran this experiment. Now, myself, I wasn't the original person who asked this question. Uh, then a student of mine, and now a colleague of mine, Derek Barra, he's in the front right here, um, he was the original person who asked this question. Derek uh, was a student at the university that I work at. I work for a program called the Florida Interactive Entertainment Academy. We're a graduate game development program at the University of Central Florida down in Orlando, Florida. Um, we're the second largest university in the country. And so we're a 16-month program. We bring together artists, producers, and programmers, and we put them on real-world projects. And so students are working on game teams, and we're really simulating the game industry as closely as possible. So at the time, it was fall of 2012, and Derek was working with some fellow students of about 12 students, and he was working on a game called Save the Dodos. And this was a game a lot like sort of lemmings. You had dodos, they were trying to cross a cliff, and you had different ways of trying to save them. Um, Derek was part of this class right here. We bring in about 50 to 60 students every single fall into our grad program um, at FIA. And so you can see Derek's up there in the corner. Hi, Derek. Um, so when he had this idea, he began to develop uh, what would become Scrum Hero. And so what is Scrum Hero? Probably has to be asked at some point, since it's an unusual term. Um, it really is taking standard Scrum, the idea of standard Scrum, which you're probably, um, to some degree, all familiar with. You see here a very typical Scrum board. And it's adding significant game mechanics onto standard daily Scrum. So you can just see visually here, from the previous board here, to what started to get built out for Scrum Hero, there's a lot more going on. So um, tasks become quest. There's a there's a gameplay board in the middle of uh, in the middle of the board here that was very Dungeons and Dragons like, um, where you had characters, weapons. You would face off against um, each other. So a whole um, complex set of of of, um, of rule sets and mechanics of which I won't have completely the time to get into here, but certainly would take questions about it afterwards. That's a fantastic question. <laughs> Something I'm going to address right now. <laughs> but thank you for bringing it up. If, if uh, there's any other holes uh, intellectually, please ask them. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm so glad I put that slide in. <laughs> I look like a genius. Um, so Scrum, oh <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. I, I'm, a, I'm a professor, so I appreciate questions. Um, it's a development methodology popular in software and game development, OK? And if any of you are in that, uh, those fields, you're probably, you're probably using Scrum. There's, there's a long, long definition of Scrum, but I'm going to go into the short one for, for time's sake. One of the main features of it that we took for Scrum Hero is it features short daily meetings. Oftentimes, those meetings are done standing up. And they are really all about, what did you do today? What tasks are you going to be doing tomorrow? And sort of the obstacles go that you think are in, those w in, in the way of that. Um, and so they're very, very brief meetings. Those also almost become the rounds of Scrum Hero, OK, those short daily meetings. The other thing that's really important for Scrum Hero is that work was broken up into manageable, identifiable tasks. So tasks are chunked up into very, um, into very uh, distinct groups, OK? There's also some kind of visual or digital board to track the progress. So I showed you that, that typical Scrum board. You obviously saw the Scrum Hero board. There's usually some kind, of, some kind of board in a room somewhere that is tracking the progress of the project that you're working on. All Scrum has a Scrum Master, somebody who is running those meetings. Uh, making sure that the meetings begin and end on time, um, making sure that all the uh, problems are being solved on the development team. For our sake, the Scrum Master then becomes kind of the Game Master for Scrum Hero. 
However, as I'll, as I'll stress through, the, through this uh, presentation, Scrum is not a game within itself. I know some people do consider that, and it does have some game elements to it, but it's really more of a development tool. So there was a couple of versions of Scrum Hero. Um, when Scrum Hero first started out and was being developed, it was all about improving the uh, time estimation of the dev. So if I, got, if I got assigned a task and I was an artist and it was to animate a character, and I estimated that that was going to take uh, three hours. It's really important for the team that that estimate be pretty accurate. That way the Scrum Master can start estimating how long the total project is going to take um, and how long that specific project is going to, that, that specific task is going to take. And so the first version of Scrum Hero aimed to improve the estimation accuracy of the task for each of the devs. So in this case, Patrick, this developer right here, he was given a task. And then he put down, it's hard to see with this contrast, but he put down one hour, okay, for how long he thought that task was going to take. Well, what could happen then is there was a betting mechanic, and so all the other members of the team could then bet on Patrick and whether he thought that he would complete that task within an hour. So if I put down three tickets, now tickets were the currency of the game, okay? So that's what you earned or lost were tickets, okay? A and so if I had tickets and I put three tickets down on Patrick's um, task, and he completed it within under an hour, then I doubled my, my ticket earnings. Now, you could not bet on yourself. You could only bet on other members of your team. And in that way, it encouraged the team to look around and learn about the other developers and learn about their reputations for completing tasks on time. Okay? So, a pretty simple betting mechanic here. The other great part of the first version of Scrum Heroes is that it had a reward system that was tied into the work that they were doing themselves. Remember, I told you they were making a game called Save the Dodos. So there was dodo characters, and every week there was a contest about which type of dodo would you like to see in the game. And so you could take your tickets and then vote on the ones, uh, the one that you wanted to be uh, seen in the game, okay, as a developer. So earning tickets became very motivating, of course, because if you really wanted this dodo to make it in the game, well, then you had to place your vote by putting your tickets down. That was kind of the early version of, of Scrum Hero. Uh, we took that initial idea and that initial success that Derek had running that, and we turned it into version two, which is what I'm going to talk most about today, and what you saw earlier in those pictures. Scrum Hero version two really is almost a full fantasy-based role-playing game. It's got characters, it has levels, um, you know, your characters and everything, um, um, it doesn't have levels like, like uh, video game levels. It has characters and weapons that level up. Um, you get tickets awarded for every two hours of work for arriving on time to your Scrum meeting. And the goal was to, and is, to improve productivity and morale. So as the game morphed from version one to version two, it became more complex, and it wanted to deal with, uh, with more behaviors. You can see the more pictures of the board, of the Scrum Hero board here. So these all became uh, quests that each, of the, that each of the devs was doing. Um, again, you could see how the board even progressed and got more complicated, um, where you could play. Um, and fight each other as well as fight um, enemies. There was treasure chests as well that gave you power-ups and certain abilities. So fall 2012 ends. Um, Derek and I are, are working on the game. We're talking about the results of the game. And what did we think? So Derek has these 12 developers. We were both like, from talking to the developers, talking to each other, we thought it was a success. We like, that felt like that really helped the development of that game. Felt like it helped the development of that project. We thought the morale was better. We thought the productivity was better. but those were hunches, really. Uh, how are we going to prove that this thing really worked? And so we began to talk about, do you think there's a way that we could um, do an experiment for this? Could we, could we really work this and actually see if it really works, or are we just being optimistic, right? So that's when we came up with the idea of doing an experiment. So the first thing we had to do with any experiment, if you guys have done experiments, you know this, is what are you going to measure? Well, why are you doing it, right? What, what do we want to find out about it? And for us, we wanted to measure productivity. Obviously, for many of you, if you're going to gamify something, you want to improve the productivity of your workers. If you were in here for the Applebee's talk, that was a lot of what that was about, reducing turnover, increasing productivity of, of the workers. We wanted to do the same thing. But when you say productivity, what does that mean for us? Right? What does that mean for a game developer? Well, we decided to try to come up with two different measurements, really. Um, number of hours worked. We thought that was a, a pretty good data point that would be tracked. Of course, the more hours work, the more productive typically somebody is. Not always. <laughs> and number of tasks completed. So those are the two things we were going to try to measure um, to see if they were uh, uh, see how Scrum Hero could improve them. 
The other thing we wanted to find out is, were we right? Did, was there an effect on morale and culture? Did, the, did these uh, student game developers really like using Scrum Hero? Did it improve their uh, morale? Would they want to come to meetings and things like that more? And we were going to do that through surveys and through anecdotal evidence, okay? So we were going to survey them afterwards. The second thing we probably had to figure out, and you're probably getting to that right now in your head, which is, how are we going to measure it? All right, so how, how are we going to do this, right? What are we, who are we going to do this on? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I work at a, at a graduate game development program at UCF, FIA, and every year we bring in a new class of 60 students. So in fall 2012, as this was wrapping up and we were having this discussion, this group of students was coming into our building. 60 brand new students, producers, programmers, and artists. And we have a capstone game process. So at the end of fall, uh, our first semester, uh, the students get put onto capstone uh, teams. These are essentially their master's thesis. They work on a game for seven months on teams of 10 to 20 people. So it really does replicate the size and the duration of a lot of industry projects that are out there. And so when these teams started getting, uh, started getting formed, Derek and I went to them and we made a pitch for Scrum Hero. We said, hey, five development teams, would you guys be interested in using Scrum Hero and seeing and reporting the data back to us? And we had five different games, like I mentioned, and what we got back was several different answers. We had a team called Grapple and Intrepid. They were both gonna use Scrum, and they were both interested in using Scrum Hero. So they said a complete yes, thank you. We had two teams that were gonna use Scrum, but weren't really sure they wanted to use Scrum Hero. So they said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll report the data to you, but we're not gonna use Scrum Hero. Fantastic, that was Escheril and a game called Pitch Jumper. And then we had one team that it was a bunch of students who just were going to do it their own way. They weren't going to use any development methodology at all. They were going to sit around and have meetings and throw, you know, footballs at each other. Um, and so they, we just completely left them out. But what we had perfectly set up was sort of a good A-B test, right? An experiment group and a control group that we could work from. So we started out um, in January of 2013 with uh, these four teams particularly that we're going to be looking at. And for about four weeks, we, uh, we measured their work. Yes, sir. Yes, the teams were aware that there was, yes, the, all the teams were aware who was using Scrum Hero and who, who was not. It was not a blind test in any, in any way, if that's your question. So over four weeks, we, uh, we set out to, to measure. Um, we sat with the teams and we talked to them. So the first team, Grapple, that was going to use Scrum Hero, they start out and they start implementing Scrum Hero, uh, their version of it, but they do it kind of haphazardly. They're not really that committed to it, frankly. And they set stuff up. You can see they start setting up a board here. They do have some elements of, of what looks like the Scrum Hero board. Uh, they kind of, they didn't customize it for the team. Um, and it was sort of done almost not as an afterthought, but they really didn't put their heart and soul into it. Conversely, the Intrepid team, the, other, the, the second team that used Scrum Hero, really uh, went crazy with the idea. So the first thing they did is that their development director surveyed the team and said, what is everybody's favorite game? Like, what, what kind of games do you guys like to play? And they all came back and they found out they love Pokemon. <laughs> so they came up with their version of Scrum Hero called Poke Scrum, right? And when they all figured that out, it took off from there. They built a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful series of boards that took up um, almost an entire room. Um, you can, they also, every person had their own game playing card that had their inventory, the badges that they had earned. They came up with a really elegant rule set for the game. It was really beautiful. Um, very, it was complex yet easy to play. And the, the aesthetics of the, of the game were really, really paid attention to as well. I mean, look at this game playing board that they developed as well. Um, certainly a step above what we had originally done for uh, the second version of Scrum Hero. So they completely committed to the, to the game, Intrepid did. Four weeks go by, we measure all the results we start going through the data, and of course our assumption is the teams that do this, that gamify the game of development experience, are going to improve on these measures that we wanted. Right? Why else would we be doing it otherwise? That was our assumption going into it. And when we look at it, what do we get? Well, one of the measurements, total hours worked. You remember that one. This is for the complete team. Now what you're going to see here is the colored ones are Intrepid and Grapple. So Intrepid is far left is blue, and then the, the middle one there, the kind of orangey looking one, is grapple. And then the two gray ones are the teams that just use Scrum, okay? So that's how to read these charts. Total hours worked. Our first assumption was confirmed. 
Obviously, you can see here the two gamified teams scored much higher almost across the board. Now, we did have this weird anomaly with producers turning in their data, and I'll talk about that in a second. But if you just look straight across, you can see a really nice um, graph that kind of confirmed um, our assumptions. The teams that did use Scrum Hero worked more hours. Okay, fantastic. We were like, we were in a good place. Yes, sir. <laughs> right, were they, right, were they just stri strictly cutting and pasting of the boards and things? Uh, no, because it, it was measuring, uh, there was only one, really one or two people that were doing that work. Um, so it wouldn't account for that big of a difference. Um, certainly the development director, Tisha was her name, that, that did those boards and everything. She did spend a lot of time on that, n no doubt. That's a good question. When we looked at morale, that was going to be one of our measures as well. Scrum Hero morale, we also saw something interesting that confirmed and then started raising questions for us. Remember, this is Intrepid, the blue team, that really, really uh, got fully engaged in the Scrum Hero process. Across the board, their measurements of morale were through the roof, very, very high. Did Scrum Hero improve your productivity? 85% believed it did. Did it improve the team productivity? 85%. Make meetings more enjoyable? 100. More likely to attend meetings? 100. Increased morale? 100%. Fantastic, all the way across. But then we start looking at Intrepid, the other team that did it but really didn't commit to it, really wasn't passionate about it. And you can see really weird low scores. In fact, some disturbing ones. More likely to attend meetings. 83% said they wouldn't be more likely to attend a meeting because of Scrum Hero. So we started noticing this, and this was something that, that we'll, we'll try to explain as we go farther along. Another measurement of morale that got more interesting is when you see when we added in the other two teams. So how did they respond to these same questions when they were just using Scrum? As you can see, when we started adding in Scrum, well, a couple of the teams thought that Scrum did a lot of this as well. Improved team productivity. Well, Escherio, which didn't use any Scrum here at all, they had a very high rating. So while Intrepid across the board was the highest across the board, Still, the other teams that just use Scrum also saw some benefits as well in these same questions of morale. So this got a little bit more complicated with the data. Another measure of productivity that we wanted to look at, as you recall, was the average number of tasks completed. So not only the hours worked, but the average number of tasks completed. And here we got completely turned on, on end. It was like, wait a minute. Uh, this actually looks like this is worse. 10 and 9 versus 19 and 25. You can see going along the way the, the way the data started laying out. So what was going on here? We had to do kind of a second look at the data. This was our first pass at it. We weren't really sure what to make of this. It wasn't going exactly how we had wanted. And when we gave a really hard look, we found a lot of what scientists call confounding variables in the data. There were several things that, we, uh, that made the data dirty, as I like to say about this. One was, what is the definition of a task? <laughs> How do you define what a task is? So what we found, we started looking through the spreadsheets and all of that was that if I was given a task to animate a character, well, some, some teams were breaking that up into five different tasks and were submitting them as five different tasks, while one team was just submitting that as one single task. Both teams were doing the same thing, but one team looked like it was doing a lot more because of the way they were chunking the tasks up. Okay, so that was a real problem once we started looking at it. The other thing is that we allowed variable methods for how the, ta how the data got inputted. Um, one team was using a specialized tool that one of the developers made. One, a couple of the other teams were using Handsoft. Some other people were using like Excel spreadsheets and things like that. And we saw that that had an effect. The other was how do you flesh out the variability of Scrum Hero versus the variability of Scrum itself? Remember, these teams were new to Scrum as well. And as you could see from some of those survey results, Scrum had an influence as well. And it was hard to tell where the Scrum influence end and the Scrum Hero influence began. Game master motivation. We found that the team that did not have a motivated game master did not get a lot out of gamifying the process. In fact, it became and looked at as kind of busy work. We really found this when we looked in the survey quotes. So we look in the survey quotes, and this is Intrepid, the team that went all in, that committed all in. I don't even care about Scrum without the Pokemon. <laughs> Poke Scrum is awesome. Poker Scrum was what really caused our team dynamic to develop and establish better relationships. I mean, just a, a complete 100% approval, right, of that process and endorsement of it. Conversely, though, when we looked at, at Grapple, we saw stuff like this. Now, remember, all of my students in my grad program are hardcore gamers. They're, that's what they want to do for their, for their living. Unfortunately, no one takes daily Scrum seriously. I'm too hardcore a gamer to take something treated with still little respect seriously. So the results of Scrum Hero, we believe, 
were this. Productivity did improve once you fleshed out some of those, some of those um, discrepancies that I mentioned. Morale did improve with one huge caveat, and that is you gotta have a motivated game master. You gotta have somebody who's committed to the, to the process. And when you show passion and commitment for that, your team will show the same thing, and they'll be, they'll be very involved. If you don't have that, you don't, this process is not likely to work. Finally, here are the takeaways that we learned, things that we learned from doing this experiment. First of all, you gotta establish what your goals are and then build your game, okay? Um, know what you want to measure and why you want to measure that before you build any gamified process. So for us, when we did that, that was really key because those goals then become messages that you wanna transmit to your team, whatever it may be, and those messages then can become gameplay. And this is an idea that gets fleshed out really nicely by Ian Bogost in a, ga in a book called Persuasive Games. He calls games procedural rhetoric. The rhetoric part meaning that he can, that games have the ability to transmit messages. The procedural part meaning that those messages are very sticky and very immersive and that people learn them well because it's uh, participatory. You have to do something, right, to get those, to receive those messages. Anytime we do that, we create, you know, we create a situated learning process which is so much more powerful than when we learn something in the abstract. When we learn something by doing in a, in a world, in a context that means something, it is twice as powerful. That's, that's a problem that education has. So we often teach students in a very disembodied, um, abstract way. Second, gamification has got to be more player-centric. I think this is really one of the key takeaways from us and hopefully a key takeaway for you. You've got to involve the players or your clients or your audience in the creation of your game. You have to consider them. You need to survey them. Find out what kind of games they like, what kind of game mechanics they might respond to. How old are they? Use Richard Bartle's player, uh, you know, player types. You guys are probably all familiar with this. Are they killers, achievers, socializers, or explorers? Find out those things before you start building your product. Don't just build your product and then hope that your audience likes to play this type of game or hopes that they'll react to this type of game mechanic. Find out beforehand. As you recall, the Poker Scrum team did that. They surveyed the team before they built the game. And then they built a game that all that the whole team could relate to, knew how to play, and were invested in. Give the players meaningful choice. There should be a win condition and a lose condition in whatever product that you build. The choices that you give them should be as vast as you possibly can. Now that's gonna vary, of course, depending on what you build, but you need to give the player meaningful choice. They need to feel like something is at stake as they're going through the, your gamified product. Paper or pixels? Do you need to make it digital? Well, it depends. If you want to scale it out, of course you have to, but I would encourage you to start with paper, particularly in the prototyping phase. Make sure it's fun. Make sure people know how to play it. Make sure it's easy. You saw that Scrum Hero was all up on a board. You know, it was, all, it was definitely a, a paper product. Now, Derek's also working on a digital version, um, and you'd be, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you about it. It's not quite ready for prime time, but will be, um, hopefully soon. Third thing is make as much of a game as you can. Now, I know talking to Gabe uh, Zickerman and other people before, this is a little bit of a controversial point, but I, I believe this. There's a couple of ways of looking at what makes up an actual video game or a complete game, and John Ferrara does a really nice job of this. Aesthetics, usability, balance, meaningful choice, and motivation. A lot of gamified stuff that's out there in the space today exists pretty much in this motivation realm, and that's it. Um, it only sort of touches on this. And these are also, he considers these short-term and long term, okay, so short term and long term. The more, of these, uh, the more of these characteristics of a game that you can incorporate into your product, the more successful I think your product's going to be. A lot of times we see gamified, we see gamified products that use one or two of these and then they wonder why it fails. Well, it's, hard to, it's very hard to pick and choose a one or two things from, from a product, um, from, a, from a, a game structure like this and expect it to be successful. It can happen, it depends on your audience. So again, this goes back to your audience too. Make as much of a game as you can based on what your audience wants to play and wants to do. Gamification needs a game master. You gotta have somebody, you can't just start a game and then let it roll, push it out there and then hope that it works. You gotta have somebody making sure those goals are being met for you. And that can adjust the game and tweak the rule set of the game as you go along. This is to ensure your goals are being met to deal with emergent gameplay. Is that a term anybody's familiar with? That's when somebody starts playing your game in an unusual way, a way that you, you did not intend. 
Well, how do you deal with that if something happens? And we have examples of that. I wish I had time to go into them with Scrum Hero where that happened. Also prevent griefing. This doesn't happen a lot in this space, but it happens a lot in like MMOs and, and bigger games, which is when people get into your game and they don't try to actually play the game. They try to make the experience miserable for other people who are playing the game, hence the term. And you can track your data consistently. Please, <laughs> please do that. Learn from us. Um, we didn't. One of the final takeaways is that gamification cannot overcome a bad product. If you have a bad design or a bad product, it cannot overcome it. So we had these five teams, and when we had a cut round, guess what game got cut? Intrepid, the game that did the best job of using uh, Scrum Hero and invented Poker Scrum. They just had a terrible game design. Their team was great, the development was great, but at the end of the day, their, their product itself wasn't good enough. So don't think that it can overcome a bad product. Don't, um, don't believe that, it really can't. It can improve, but it can eventually overcome it. So what do we think is for the future? Well, I'd like to see a future where we do, in gamification, more game and less ification. <laughs> okay? Again, trying to build something. I think as gamification matures, as your clients and my clients and everybody uh, wants more complex goals, um, bigger goals, um, I think we're going to have to build more games to accomplish these and stop picking and choosing just a few characteristics of them. And so I hope uh, this talk will help you move in that direction and we can uh, bring games to service more industries like education, uh, finance, um, and others that healthcare and others that are out there. Um, I'll certainly take any, do we have time for any questions back there? N that's a two questions? Okay, so maybe I can take a couple questions if there are any. Certainly if you want to contact either uh, myself or Derek, we, I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you for listening, appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, no, I, I, in, the, in the case of the game that got cut, I do not think that the, that the Pocus Scrum was a distraction at all. I do think that's possible if, if the, again, a game is not tuned really well to the team, not customized to the team. I do, it, in the other game, in Grapple, the, a lot of the feedback we got is that it felt like busy work. It felt like an extra layer of work that they didn't want to do. So I, I did, it is possible. Anyone else with any questions? Yes, sir. Right. Are, the question is, are we going to continue the experiment again? We're, we're actually talking about that. We've got to find the right time to do it. I think in the next year, we're going to rerun this experiment again similarly, s get more data points, clean, clean up some of the data, and see how it goes, because I, I think it's relevant. Yes. Yeah, I, I would love to see how it does in the industry as well. Somebody in the industry would have to be willing to take a risk on it. Obviously, we're a, we're a, we're a um, school, so we don't have millions of dollars and deadlines and that kind of stuff. That's why we're able to kind of run this. But yeah, I'd love to see it in industry. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely ways of adapting it. I mean, Scrum Hero, it was that's like a placeholder you know, name for it, and when it just kind of stuck. It's really more of like a recipe. You can take that recipe that we've kind of built, and you can tweak it um, to adapt to the kind of development that you want to do. Um, I, I would suggest those, that some of those tenets that we talked about be followed. But yeah, really the first thing is, you know, base it on your team itself. Like, what, how much game do they want to do? What kind of game would you want to build? Start with them, and then come back, and then start building something a little collaboratively. Um, and of course, you want it to match those goals that you're that you're working on. But yeah, it could it's adaptable enough to do that. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. Take care.